It is uh, 24 minutes past two. This is Australia Overnight. Tony Moakley here, 13 13 32. There are many phone lines open. If you would like to tell me about your favourite children's book that you read as a kid or a factory tour that you have done. Kenny, good morning. Morning, Tony. You're in the studio. Well, I was just uh, staying behind doing a little bit of pre-production there. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you are. That's good because I'm, you're a you're a good presence around the place. I'm a company man, you know. You are. No, I like that. I like that a lot. I'll stay behind for Macquarie. <laughs> I think you might be staying behind for other reasons, but we won't get into that. What factory tours? Have you done a factory tour? I heard you mention that. And I think this is one of the greatest topics I've ever heard on radio because when I was in school, yeah. we did the factory tours. Which now? Like, so you've you've mentioned. Tours. Mm. Talk me through them. In high school, uh, in going to school in Melbourne and going to school in Moorabbin. Yeah. Moorabbin is the home of the Coca-Cola factory. Hello. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Do you reckon every kid in school didn't want to be there on the Coca-Cola tour? And so what happens on that tour? You just go round the factory and you do the tour and you see where Coke is made and you're given the demonstration on how the bottles come in and how the syrup goes in and then it all gets mixed together and it's all the magical combination and you're just salivating. You know, 13, 14-year-old boys yeah. just looking at Coca-Cola. Thank you. And just, just thinking, when do we get the free Coca-Cola? When's the free Coke? <laughs> and there was free oh, Coke at the free end? Coke at the end, absolutely. And so, hang on, was that the Fanta factory as well? Oh, that's the Fanta factory. Yeah, I think they're making Tab at the yeah. time as well. Okay. Which I think they just took like a teaspoon of sugar out and yeah. suddenly it was Tab. <laughs> okay. And can you tell me if the people making Tab were slimmer than the people making the regular Coke? I, I knew because I spoke to them. The people there were fed up with Coca-Cola. I think it's like people who work at a chocolate factory. And I did the, the tour of the Cadbury Cadbury's factory. Cadbury's in Tasmania. Yes. Awesome. Which, which now has been stopped. Why? Did you know? No. No, I was devastated when I heard this because I went to the Cadbury factory because I'm literally a part owner of Cadbury yeah. with the amount of <laughs> yes. Cadbury chocolate that yeah. I eat. And you went round and you did the tour and <laughs> the great thing about that was that they give you a hairnet, of course, oh, with yeah. it being food. Yeah. They gave you a, a little thing to a little netting thing to wear over your head. I discovered that because every section that you went to, they'd say, oh, no, the, uh, grab a handful of the little cherry ripes there and that type of thing. Well, I ran out of room in my pockets. Yeah. I started grabbing these free hairnets at every entrance <laughs> and I was filling up the hairnets with all the time. I was bulging awesome. as I went out of the place. But they have stopped the tours. Why? There are no tours. The tour stopped and it went to a, a, like a Cadbury experience and you'd go in and there'd be a video uh. display and you'd, then you'd go to the shop. Even that has finished. So, okay, 13, 13, 32. If you know why tours have stopped in the Cadbury factory in Tasmania, this is a place that needs every tourist dollar it absolutely. can get. Absolutely. Because my brother and sister both did it on a school excursion in the 70s. So they've done it and they came back and it was literally like having been to paradise. We sat at their feet while they waxed <laughs> lyrical about this magic place where, you know, it was like Homer Simpson talking about the Duff Brewery. It was... Now, it, look, I might have been 13 when I was at the Coca-Cola factory. But I was in my 30s at the Cadbury factory, and I was still fascinated. I didn't want to leave. I think I was there for hours. They had to literally boot me out of the place. So when, so you don't know roughly speaking when they in, can in, this tour? In the last few years. Okay. Yeah, what? And there was just an outrage. Well, so there should have been. That's, that, that is a ridiculous decision. Um, uh, speaking of Barabin and factories, I worked in a job once that would send me around as a kitchen hand, and I ended up at the Philip Morris factory. Oh, yes. And um, where you could, at the time, this is going back about 30 years ago, you could smoke in the, in the canteen. And it had a huge sign on the walls that detailed, uh, it was like a smoker's bill of rights. You know, what you are doing is perfectly legal. Um, you have the choice to smoke or to not, all this sort of stuff. I remember that uh, vividly. But, yeah, that's possibly the last factory I was in. Um, were, you, were, you smoke, were you a smoker? I was, yes. Ooh. Yes. Well, that would have been like me being at the Coca-Cola factory. They didn't it? give out free you samples. You watching that tobacco come off no, the line they, there and no, being rolled. And... They were very, very big on that. They did not. No, I was straight into the kitchen, worked there, and then out. Do you remember the scene in The Simpsons where they did a tour of the, of the mint? Mint, yes. Where they made the money? Was that one of the, do you remember the lines? Yeah, was that one of the most classic pieces of writing that you've ever seen in a, well, I was going to say a sitcom, in a, in a 
cartoon series, basically. Do you remember the line? Oh, absolutely. Can you give it to us, Kenny? Well, I perceive I can't do it verbatim, but uh. of course there's the tour group and they're all there and the gentleman's standing there and he's telling them all about the wonderful mint and, he's, and he throws it in the gag at the end. <laughs> and I'm terribly sorry. No, we don't give out free samples. And of course the whole tour group just erupts in laughter as it pans across to the back of the group and there's Homer. Mm. Lousy <laughs> cheapskate government. <laughs> Awesome stuff. Hi, Tony in Montalvis. How's it going, Tony? Good, thanks. Have you done a factory tour? No, not a factory tour, unfortunately. I, I have a book for you. Oh, okay. Do yeah, go on. Uh, do you remember The Wishing Tree by Edith Blyton? Mm, uh, no, I don't. Uh, no, it's oh. not the magic faraway tree we're talking. Oh, it might have been. It might have been. My memory's a bit rough now, but... It was the the tree that you could climb up, and there was there was Moonface, and there was yeah, that's um, the magic faraway tree by um, C. S. Lewis, isn't it? That wasn't Enid mm. Blyton from memory. Who was who was who was Edith Blyton then? I, I thought it was the uh, no, it was um, Enid Blyton who wrote uh, yeah. God, the Secret Seven, the Fabulous Five. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. she was a she was a prodigious uh, children's author, the Magic Faraway Tree. Oh, you're right, it was by Enid Blyton. So you had the you had the name of it. Well, anyway, I was half right. You're I was half, half right. right there, Tony. It is a it's a great book, and I've read that to my daughter, and it is the gift that keeps yeah. on giving. It is a really really good book. It's and, great and it's... terribly English. They get very excited around tea time, <laughs> Kenny. Very excited. Oh, I'm ever so pleased to be going to the garden. <laughs> you do that too well. Oh, oh well, oh, yeah. It's, I've read the book a few times. What can well, I say? Obviously. So that was that was your favourite book then, Tony? Yeah, so it was one I read to my kids. My uh, my son's now uh, 49. But... Indeed he is. Thank you, Tony. Um, Kenny, your favourite book as a kid? Oh, now I was discussing this with Simon, who I work with here also, yeah. doing pre-production into the Wee Small Elves, because we're both company men, basically, yeah. really. That's yeah, why we're here. you're not allowed to leave. No. You work uh, well for debt to society. There was a, now, we were encouraged to read in school, and this game, this is going back to 13, 14 at Moorabbin Tech. Yeah. And we were encouraged to read and encouraged to go down to the school library and take out a book. Now, for some reason, I found a book, and I have never forgotten its title, and I have never seen it since those early 80s days at Moorabbin Tech, and it was a book entitled it's not that i'm work shy <laughs> and i cannot remember who the author was but i just found it and it's looked like a pretty you know simple book to read yeah. and i took that book back to the classroom it is one of the funniest books that i have ever read and i could not stop laughing and of course what happened to me i got into trouble because you were re you were laughing while i was reading laughing the book. yeah but i was reading the book and enjoying the book yeah and it entertained me you couldn't run that defence in the Mujura West Library when I was a kid when we discovered Where Did I Come From? Oh. <laughs> now, a bunch of eight-year-olds around cartoon drawings of naked people <laughs> was just... Uh, that was just kryptonite, that book, and it was quickly taken away from us by the librarian. But there we were, being self-educating about yes. the birds and the bees, exactly. which, which saved parents and grown-ups the awkwardness of having to do it themselves. Which was the purpose of the book. Y yes, thank I'm, you. I'm sure the purpose of me going to the school library in class and getting a book out was so that I would go back and enjoy reading. I'm not, what As was I the, did. What was the title? I'm not... It's not that I'm work shy. Right. Now, I have never seen the book since it was confiscated from me in that particular class. Yeah. And I am terrified now to ever find it. Simon has said to me, oh, we can find it. We'll Google it. Yeah. And I'm terrified now to actually read it as a much later than 13-year-old boy yeah. and discover that maybe it wasn't really that funny after all. It probably wasn't, but it does sound like a hilarious justification of laziness. Uh, not that I'm work shy. We've found it. That Paul... Paul Groves. Paul Groves, that's there it. There you go. All right. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Um, the book that the guy got mixed up about... Yeah. He's thinking of The Wishing Chair, and that was one of my favourites growing up. Can you tell us about The Wishing Chair, Jessica? It was, uh, two siblings, a brother and a sister, that would get in this red chair that would grow wings and then fly them to faraway places. That sounds a little... And they'd go on adventures. Okay. A little bit trippy or not? It was one of the Enid Blyton ones. Ah, uh, of course. Yes, she'd hit a pretty rich vein by that stage. Um, yes. 
did, have you tried to replicate that in any way by tying helium balloons to a deck chair yourself? <laughs> No, the biggest trouble that we get up to is uh, probably swinging off the clothesline. Yes, okay. She was an awesome author, Enid Blyton. She was just... So you didn't branch into her other works at all? No, the, the wishing chair was one of the ones that my mum would read to me growing up. So that's uh, one of the fond ones that I remember. Okay, well, according to... Um, uh, Wikipedia, so we take this with a grain of salt, Jessica. The three children's stories were as follows. Adventures, adventures of the wishing chair, wishing chair again, and more wishing chair stories. Ah, there you go. I only know the first two. There we go. So were they a little bit twee in that very English way? There was supper? Yep. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, it seems to have done you well, Jessica. Thank, no, you for, thank, thank you, you for sharing much. that with us and thank you for not inventing a 49-year-old child while you're at it. Hi, Roger in Melbourne. Good, Tony, how are you going? Good, thanks. Uh, the Outsiders, that was then, this is now, S.E. Hinton. I don't know that. Can you tell us about that? Uh, just coming of age, teenage sort of, uh, and sort of movies. Um, uh, they're actually, sorry, movies, uh, novels. They're actually made into movies in the... Yeah. Oh, I think we've lost him. Mm, Roger's either gone under a tunnel or under a bus. I you there, Roger? <laughs> I'm the foreman of the ladder. Have we got sorry, you, Roger? Mate. That's no, all right. Yeah, sorry to see you. Sorry, you, yeah. you sound like you were getting a bit emotional there. No, 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 no. Sorry, mate. So sorry. What, what, was, what was the name of that series again? Uh, there was The Outsiders. Um, that was then, this is now. Yeah. Uh, Rumblefish. Okay, and it, what, it was classic kind of troubled teens? Yeah, troubled teens, sort of gang, sort of uh, books. Oh, my brother got really into that. My younger yeah. brother, yes. Yeah, they were pretty good. Yeah, okay. I actually just would, bought a couple of the movies for my daughter to see if she can get into it as well. Uh, would you like her to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there's Better than some of the crap that's out there, to be honest. Well, yeah, I've I, I got to say, I reckon most kids' fiction these days is pretty good. And oh, kids, <laughs> kids have a pretty good uh, sensor, I would say, for what's good and what's not. I'm not a big fan of some of the stuff she's reading now, like those, um, uh, what do you call it, those vampire sort of stuff. Um, oh, that's very big, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah young adult it. fiction. Yeah, not into that, really. Yeah, okay. Well, not maybe into. steer it towards Biggles. Can't go wrong. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thanks, there you go. Thank buddy. you, Roger. Uh, Ken Francis is with me, and we're talking either factory tours or your favourite kids book and we have finally tracked down that book your what guide to how not to be lazy what was it <laughs> it's not that <laughs> it's i'm not that i'm work shy what an awesome title for a book bill has gone from thorbury hi bill hi uh hi tony how are you yeah good thanks i uh many many years ago uh happened to have some uh, concert tickets in uh in uh, tasmania yeah and i headed down and uh during uh, after the concert, me, me and a me and a friend decided to to go to the Cadbury factory, and we had we had an absolute ball of a time, uh, much much like uh, your friend there with the with the hairnets, uh, very similar story. So, what time are we talking, Bill? When what year was the Cadbury tour still going on? Oh, so this would have been at least thirty years ago. Um, but more recently, I uh, went up with a few few of the grandkids. Yeah, uh, about two years ago, and uh, okay, thanks we for were... that. Thanks, Bill. That was. Um, it's a pity we didn't hear the end of that because I'm sure it was going to be a, a highly amusing anecdote. Um, Sounded a lot like my tour of the the Cadbury factory. I I don't think yours was um, going to be as as ball tearingly hilarious as that. But so I think I've deprived everybody of a great story. Factory tours. Where have you been? Two thirty eight. This is Australia Overnight, 13, 13, 32. It's 19 minutes to three. Bob Tarlow joins us again after three. He's back from assignment in San Francisco. 13, 13, 32 is the phone number here. Ken Francis is riding shotgun because we are trying to get to the bottom of this. Ken, um, when did Cadbury bring the chocolate... When did they pull up the chocolate drawbridge mm. at the factory? At what stage do they say no more factory tours i believe it was done for the the reasons as, as all great things come to an end these days the reasons of ohns you reckon that they apparently there's a story that they just couldn't have people wandering through the the cadbury factory 
why can other food factories do it, but not... Why do they have to be a bunch of wonkers about it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Australia Overnight is brought to you by Pestrol, DIY Safe Pest Control Products and Solutions. Pestrol. Now, um, were you a Roald Dahl fan at all, Kenny? No, I was not a great reader. In fact, if I was reading anything as a kid, I was reading Duke and Ram. Oh, you know, great Australian what, magazines. Yeah, seeing what JPY and TMG were up to that week. Have you got many copies? Have you archived many copies of them? Yes, I have. Because they are hard to get, oh, I would have thought. Absolutely. You don't want to come to my house ever oh, okay. and open up a cupboard. Uh, okay, Seriously. right. I've got one. I think I've got one episode, one edition of it somewhere from about 1989 and in an interview with the Triffids. There you go. Oh, there we go. Let's go yeah. back. Dave McComb. Yeah. Dearly departed. Now, so we're talking Roald Dahl and... Uh, he was kind enough uh, to get one of his books read by Richard Aode. Did I pronounce that the right, uh, well wide of the mark, according to Bianca? I don't think she knows I love either. The way, I love the way you look out to the booth for confirmation with someone who just throws their hands in the air. It's like, oh, don't look at me. You've just said you're not a reader, so you weren't my go-to guy. Oh, well, true. Richard, uh, please help me, A-Y-O-A-D-E. And this is where I find out he's probably the hottest actor on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always the last to know these things. 13, 13, 32, if you know. Or if you know when Cadbury decided no more chocolate gawking in the factory. So what I'm going to do, Kenny, is play a bit of the Roald Dahl book. It's the Twits, uh, and uh, here it is, uh, back with more of your calls about factory tours you have done, uh, and anything else you'd like to contribute to the show. 13, 13, 32. Hairy faces. What a lot of hairy face men there are around nowadays. When a man grows hair all over his face, it is impossible to tell what he really looks like. Perhaps that's why he does it. He'd rather you didn't know. Then there's the problem of washing. When the very hairy ones wash their faces, it must be as big a job as when you and I wash the hair on our heads. So what I want to know is this. How often do all these hairy face men wash their faces? Is it only once a week, like us, on Sunday nights? And do they shampoo it? Do they use a hairdryer? Do they rub hair tonic in to stop their faces from going bald? Do they go to a barber to have their hairy faces cut and trimmed? Or do they do it themselves in front of the bathroom mirror with nail scissors? I don't know. But next time you see a man with a hairy face, which will probably be as soon as you step out onto the street, maybe you'll look at him more closely and start wondering about some of these things. Mr Twit was one of these very hairy-faced men. The whole of his face, except for his forehead, his eyes and his nose, was covered with thick hair. The stuff even sprouted in revolting tufts out of his nostrils and ear holes. Mr Twit felt that his hairiness made him look terrifically wise and grand. But in truth, he was neither of these things. Mr Twit was a twit. He was born a twit. And now, at the age of sixty, he was a bigger twit than ever. The hair on Mr. Twit's face didn't grow smooth and matted as it does on most hairy face men. It grew in spikes that stuck out straight like the bristles of a nail brush. And how often did Mr. Twit wash this bristly, nail brushy face of his? The answer is never, not even on Sundays. I washed it for years. Now, I should have known who Richard Ayode was. He's uh, a very funny guy. He's from uh, the IT crowd, and he's done a, and he's also in the James Bond films. He's Q. Did you know that, Ken Francis? No, I, well, not until you've mentioned it. I certainly know Q in the Bond films. I told you he was the hottest actor going around. So that was him. You should have looked him up before you mentioned him. Yeah, that would have been a good idea. quite intelligent. Yes. It's that... a little radio trick. <laughs> Google before you go to air. Right. That's a, that's a very good idea. That's all right. I'll give you another tip in the break. Now, uh, 13, 13, 32, if you'd like to call about anything in particular, we're just trying to get factory tours that you've been on, or if you know when Cadbury said, that's it, no more tours of the chocolate factory. When did they break every chocolate lover's heart in the land? I was devastated when I discovered it. I couldn't believe it. 
Hey, you yeah. know, I mentioned the Coca-Cola factory tour that we went on when I was 13. Yeah. This was at the end of the year, you know, because at the end of the year, the teachers want to take it easy. Yeah. And, you know, so the last two years, you're just doing activities and sports and going here, there and everywhere. The day after we went to the Coca-Cola factory, they took us to another factory tour. The Bundy factory, so no. you could combine the no. two? <laughs> no, yeah. well, the teachers might have gone there, but yeah. we didn't, sadly. We went to the... Patents Brakes Factory Tour. Oh, whew. But the machining I, of discs. Can I tell you what a letdown that was oh, really? for 13-year-old boys after they'd previously spent the day at the Coca-Cola factory to then go and spend a day looking at fellas standing knee-deep in iron filings yeah. and grease and overalls and lathes. Yeah, oh, what a disappointment. Too hard to please, kids, these oh. days. 13 minutes to three, back with your calls. Sure. 10 minutes to three, 13, 13, 32 is the phone call here. Uh, the phone number, I should say, after three. Bob Tarlow in a triumphant return that joins us. But right now, there are calls to be had. Hi, Stan. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. I had a tour through uh, a tobacco factory. Whereabouts? Kensington. Kensington in Melbourne, Sydney. in Sydney, yeah. Uh, WD and H. R. Wills. Okay, and were you given a, a free durry at the end? Uh, yeah, you had a smoking room. Oh, that would have been very civilised. Uh, yes, it was. Smoking jacket? No, 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 no. smoking jacket. Okay. Was good enough for life. What about um, one of those kind of 30s couches with the smoker's mate next to it? No, that... no. You're just a walking to it, you know, seeing from the how cigarettes were made from the word go. You wouldn't be walking too briskly in a cigarette <laughs> factory, I'd imagine. You you know, you would have been uh, kind of conserving your energy, so to speak. What yeah, year well, I, uh, what, what year are we talking, Stan? Oh in the, the late forties. Oh early 50s. wow, okay. <laughs> And so, like, how old were you? Was that just a way of bodging a cheap smoke? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was at school. Yeah. And uh, probably 14 when there was a tour through there. I bet you the teacher got a free packet. Probably. Yeah, that'd be right. Was it? Was this and, a... Uh, sorry, Stan, was this a co-ed school? Was there boys and girls on this tour? I was a co-ed school, but the boys and girls didn't have to the factory tour together. Stan, what do you reckon the odds are now that you would have primary school children at a cigarette factory? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, not great. No, there'd be some sort of outcry lasting for weeks. Yeah, I went through the school when I was 14, and when I was 18, I got a job there. <laughs> Good work. What were you doing? Uh, doing a bit of everything in the... And it's, it's, uh, WD and H.R. Wills was, was actually the three factories in one. It was a cigarette factory. Yeah. A tobacco factory. And a printing factory that made all uh, cigarette boxes and things like that. I was going to say, Stan, would you have collected cards at the time? Oh, about a hundred thousand. Yes, because they would be worth something. I think, as far as I know, they're still quite collectible. Absolutely. To... Uh, there'd be that many, and all, all the cigarette uh, packets then, would, uh, when you first smoke them, they'd, they'd fall up flat, and, you, and you'd pitch them along the ground up against the wall, you know, closer to the wall and all that. But there was, a, there was that many different brands of cigarettes made by the one firm, and it was, it was probably the best part of 50. A lot of product uh, deviation back then, if that's even the word. I don't know. You'd need your, your passport to smoking pleasure, which is what Marbury <laughs> used to be, if you remember that. Thank you, Stan. I don't uh, think you're allowed to mention brands, are you? Uh, no, probably not. Probably not. Anyway, <laughs> I said nothing. I said nothing. It's seven minutes to three, 13, 13, 32. 13, 13, 32 is the phone number here. It is uh, three and a half minutes to three. Ken Francis has joined me. Uh, Bob Tarlow is in after three. Uh, Kirk, no, Kirk, I tell a lie. I have exaggerated the return of Bob. Kirk Clyatt is instead uh, filling in for Bob, and uh, Kirk's, Kirk's chats have been terrific. So I look forward to uh, touching base with him after three. Jeff has called. Hi, Jeff. 
Oh, g'day there, uh, Tony, and hi there, Ken. G'day, Jeff. Um, yeah, tours, guys. We um, recently, probably only a couple of months ago, we were up in far north Queensland and we did a tour of the Tully Sugar Mill. Um, and it was absolutely magnificent. They're really geared up for it. You, obviously, a lot of health and safety things you've got to deal with. And um, so you start with a big chat, you get your fluoro vest, you get your eye protection, but then they give you a set of cordless headphones um, so that the guide can talk to you over all the noise and racket that's going on. And... Um, yeah, it was absolutely. We probably spent a good hour there, I'd say, and went right from the sugar cane coming in on the um, the trains right the way through to um, the sugar at the end, I guess. See, I would find that really enjoyable. Mm. So, are we talking brown sugar, caster sugar, raw sugar? Uh, obviously, not artificial sugar. Do you see the whole lot? You see the whole lot. Well, um, well, yeah. The the sort of stuff they have at the end goes off to other places. For it's like a coarse brown sugar, I guess. With yeah. the end product, but there's so many byproducts as well as they go. But one of the interesting sort of um, little known things, I guess, is that um, the molasses that they get out in one stage of it, if you've got something that's completely covered in rust and you drop it in molasses, it comes out as clean as anything over a period of time, like the molasses will eat the rust they were telling us off, off metal. It's incredible. I had no idea it could do that. No, they showed us uh, an old spanner that they'd done it half done, and it was yeah, really un unbelievable. Yeah, it was a really interesting um, tour, and yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. I've got to say. What was the name of it again, Jeff? Tully Sugar, T U L L Y. Yep, and, and Far North Queensland. Yeah, it's in Far North Queensland. Yeah, there up, you up go. on the up on the, up, up on the table end, I think it would have been from memory. Yep. All right. The, what do you reckon of that, Kenny? Gives you a whole new appreciation, doesn't it? When you go in and you see the fellas and they're working there and yeah. when you look at your product next time when it's there on the kitchen table and you're press, you know, throwing a bit of sugar on the Wheaties, it's just a whole new appreciation for what life's all about. That's what an amazing thing sugar is. Good Lord. Take that, WD-40. I'll drop my spanner in molasses. <laughs> see if I don't. Um, now... There's going to be a fact about Melbourne, uh, the uh, Cadbury factory. Stick around, it will be after three, and then Kirk Clyde will join us from the United States.